All right. Um, I think we should get started. Um, this is the globalization and uh, television session. My name is Teddy Orgner, and I'm a PhD student at the University of Oregon. So, <laughs> 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 yeah, that helps. So uh, we have our panel still. If you can join them, Andre, uh, and uh, we apparently don't have Abdul Razak here. So we will go um, in, in, in the order of the list, uh, starting with um, Michael, and then um, Andre and Rodrigue, Rodriguez will, Rodrigo would fo will follow, and then Harsha. All right? type of a room, so this feels wonderful. Um, what I'm talking about today is American Idol, specifically the show American Idol Gives Back, which has been broadcast three times, and what I want to do is put that into a framework of how we should understand what exactly they're giving back and, and understand what types of changes structurally have taken place in terms of the format of the show so as to uh, sort of cover and suture some of the things that I think it's actually doing. So uh, first of all, a little bit of background. Surprisingly, not a lot of scholarship has been done on the idea of the telethon. Um, in looking at it, uh, most of the work, and again, I, I would say I've, I've only found about seven or eight pieces that have specifically talked about it, are dealing with textual analyses or the ways in which we frame disability in these types of spaces. Uh, some related to identity politics. Uh, there's some work that was do done recently with uh, Hurricane Katrina and the ways in which certain people have been erased from the uh, understanding of that storm. But really not much work has been done in terms of the form and content of how we should understand the evolution of the telethon and especially in terms of history. When I say English, I mean nothing in English that I'm aware of uh, at this point that talks about how we can uh, position the telethon as a, a you know, sort of a commercial production, so to speak. The history, uh, so a little bit of background for the history, of course, the big one is the MDA Jerry Lewis telethon. Uh, 21 and a half hour broadcast starts in 1966 with one station and ends up raising $1 million has been going now for 45 years. Uh, some major changes in the last two years, but still in 2011, 150 stations, $61.5 million. Uh, started in 2011, it, it started to go into a six hour rolling broadcast across the different um, time zones as a way of raising money. And largely this is because of developments. Uh, as we've taken a look in the last 40 years, the changes in the FCC have uh, had a looser definition for how they uh, term public interest content. And of course, the looser restrictions on ownership, we all know the Telecom Act of 1996, meant that fewer stations were impelled to actually carry this. And in fact, 1987, with the rise of cable and commercial incentives, Fox went so far as to discourage its affiliates from actually covering this material. Today, uh, many times the, the telethon, especially the Jerry Lewis telethon, is a victim of changing times and temperaments. It doesn't have the appeal that we younger generation folks uh, would be looking for. So we take a look at where, what American Idol is before we get into American Idol Gives Back. What is it structurally? Um, well, I will argue in the paper that it's sort of a celebration of free market relations. And again, I'm sort of going to glide over these quickly. We can go into them in more deal if you'd like in the questions. But what we see on the show is conceptions of individualism. Competition clearly is a big part of it. Consumerism, uh, which I'll, I'll go into a little bit more. And of course, meritocracy, the idea that we all vote and have a, a means of creating superstars that go beyond sort of the corporate... Uh, processes. The implicit aspect of it is, of course, of an, an apolitical politics. In 2006, an ABC pool, poll found uh, that 35% uh, of Americans felt that their vote to vote somebody off of American Idol was more important than voting for the president. 35%. Uh, it's kind of frightening. Of course, uh, spectacle and the idea of DeBoard and, and uh, what I'm using in a different uh, aspect of the paper with Lacan and sort of ocular society is a big part of how we understand our gaze in relationship to American Idol. But my focus today is more on the political economy. The show's success is consistently, although it sort of has become old hat now, 10 years in, it's in the top three in terms of audience pull, including last year. Uh, approximately 30 mal million viewers. Uh, it's estimated earnings over 10 years, $9 billion. And there are 70 versions of it globally, which is, again, something we've talked about in other panels. Its impact has been huge on business and public and societal and media dynamics, specifically in the relationship to how we understand commercialized pop music and, of course, commercialized television products as franchises. The corporate cross-promotion, the best example would be Kelly Clarkson. We all remember that wonderful film she did. Uh, and, of course, all the facts in which you try and brand this star and all of that is tied to 19 Productions or 19 Entertainment as they're known now. 
So what I argue in the paper is in some sense we have this quintessential celebration of America as we understand it in terms of democracy, uh, direct democracy rather than what we really have, a liberal democracy or representative democracy. Some of the issues of capitalism are part of that. And of course values become very important because Fox of course is a station of values uh, and we'll come back to that <laughs> later. What we have today with uh, the contemporary telethons, we see this intersection of music, spectacle, identity, and emotion as a means of raising money. So the most recent events, of course, 9-11, raising money for the tragedy that took place in New York. Katrina, again, raising money, although you know Kanye West had a different impression of what was going on there. And the Asian tsunami, uh, most recently. Uh, the one I want to tie it to, because it di ties directly into American Idol uh, Gives Back, is Live Aid and Live Aid. And I've written on this in other places, but Live Aid specifically was you know, one of the first of its kind in terms of globalization, trying to raise money to solve problems. Bob Geldof and company found out that wasn't going to work. So in Live 8, we tried a new model, and that was we don't want your money, we want your politics. And of course, that it w didn't work very well either. I had uh, students who were in Philadelphia and couldn't tell me what the concerts were about. Uh, but what he decided to do was actually use this organization, Bono being a big part of it, One.org, and of course the data campaign, Debt Aid Trade in Africa, as a means of raising political engagement as opposed to money to take on the G8 uh, and the idea of what awareness about G20 politics could do. Uh, fantastic idea, of course it never really caught on. So Bono, being ever the entrepreneur, decided to hook up with Simon Fuller and 19 Entertainment, the producer of American Idol, to give us a show, American Idol Gives Back. And when asked why, Fox News said, American Idol has given us so much to this, or American Idol has given so much to this network and we don't take that for granted. To quote a famous superhero with a gift of power comes great responsibility, which is why we feel so fortunate to partner in this special television event, Giving Back. What is it? Well, the show statistics are very important. American Idol that has been, as I say, the number one show in America for a long time. Uh, dropping off now, but still in the last year, still in the top three. It appeals to a wide demographic in our age of fragmentation. It's a family show, and many people can watch it. And of course, the second order distribution, dissemination, circulations are very big. Uh, in fact, it's been called mind-boggling in its ability to franchise games, music, theme park videos, etc. If you go on and Google, uh, you'll be able to get a chance of really how they've extended the brand. So it's money to the core. Sponsors are very important. Of course, now its 30-second ad as of last year was between 450,000 and 1.3 million uh, per 30-second ad. Uh, its product placement, it was the number one shill last year with 577 overt placements, uh, according to Nielsen Media. And of course, with its estimated earnings at so much, uh, it seems to be a market that's going to work. Another uh, individual uh, going up against it called it the Death Star. Anything you put in place against American Idol is going to die. Uh, the Teleshon uh, basically was retooled to become American Idol Gives Back. Well, what do I mean by retooled? We reframe American Idol, so specifically using a textual analysis where you have the show dynamics shifting. A singular competitive performance becomes a series of images of a collective empathetic choral singings. The music and structure of the show goes from classic pop and rock tunes to, no kidding, this is a quote from one of the producers, life anthems of compassion and hope. <laughs> Judges and celebrities who were previously deliver verdicts are now delivering appeals, testimonials, gathering your empathy. Corporate sponsors, traditional advertising themes become social responsibility, <laughs> ethical consciousness. They're focusing on the ways in which they can uh, do good for the world. Uh, the images are softened. You get a lot of first-person appeals, some vignettes, a little bit of comedy, things that aren't traditionally associated with it but invite you to be a part of it. And of course, it's about collective engagement and empowerment, which draws the audience in as a part of basically saving the world. It reframes poverty in a very important way. You have a spectacle by which you have video testimonials about the ways in which particularly the hosts and the stars are affected by what they're viewing. This is very important because, of course, as we know with uh, American Idol or any reality show, it's about us relating with the, the uh, protagonists as opposed to those who are around. So we see images, we see visits, we see engagement, we see empathy. You know, we see Simon Cowell walking through Africa touching those he's about to help. Uh, discourse of shock, sadness, he cries, he has an epiphany. As operations for this, again, this specular gaze in another part of my paper I talk about where the audience is asked to identify not with those who are suffering, but with those who are going to provide solutions, <laughs> i.e. the commercial hosts. So poverty gets sutured structurally back into the spectacle, and our solutions emerge through our engagement with the spectacle of American Idol. What do I mean by that? Well, there are tremendous contra... Oh, thank you. Yes. This is it. Yes. Viewer donations are the equation where we have real change. And I think it's important to say 200 million has been raised. That's an important note, three times. But the issue of poverty, of course, elides over this whole idea of the dynamics of capitalism have nothing to do with this. Corporate logics, power, structural impact, nothing at all. 
Uh, the American way of life or consumer mentality, not anything. There's no audience implication to ask you to say how you're a part of this problem. And of course, the active engagement where you actually get off your couch besides sending money but do something to understand it better is never, ever incurred. So there's no consideration of these contributions to the pro problem. But Fox, of course, had a wonderful tag. Fox and Idol. This is a wonderful, you know, sort of when the, yes, things are exploding on the television set. Tonight, Fox and Idol are single-handedly going to wipe out poverty, disease, and famine, all with a song in their pure, unadulterated hearts. The world can be different through our efforts. Please be a part of it. Well, what are the contradictions? Certainly, the public relations aspect of it all humanizes the corporate aspect of them, neutralizes their greedy image, buys good publicity, extends their brand revenue possibilities. And of course, they could have simply given a healthy uh, corporate donation, but of course, the spectacle of charity is very good marketing. The profits, the corporate donations, as I found out, were tax write-offs. And here's where we start to do the math. Commercials, American, uh, Fox made a big point of saying we are donating $5 million. Well, let's take a look at what they make. Per show, they make 18 million across the season, on average, 800 million. Their net worth is, of course, eight or nine billion, depending. It's the most lucrative multimedia property of all time. And when you start to dig into the financial figures of how they're actually distributing this money, there are no advertising rate released for Idol Gives Back shows, so we don't know in any way what they've done. No figures were released on the credit card text message fees, which in 2008, they made $7 million at 10 cents per text message voting. Uh, the charity projects were originally uh, held under an umbrella of Entertainment Fund, which is a collection of established charities. Fox argued and eventually succeeded in creating what was called Idol Gives Back, which was a collection of Fremantle, Fox, and 19 Entertainment. Again, all those who have stakes in the profits of this. And no financial figures have been released. So I did a little bit of work with the Better Business Bureau Wise Giving Index, and they tell you, do not donate to this charity. There are six of the 20 standards that they hold up for charity accountability, and this charity does not meet that. Therefore, they ask you not to participate in it, interestingly enough. So what do we have for conclusions? Well, of course, we have the shift where spectacular conclusions aid in the reality of charity fundraising, takes us away from the idea of the considerations of the complexities and complicities that capitalism brings into the equation. The discourse is about aid, assistance, and America's role in the world. And ultimately, if you dig deeper into it, the frame is capitalism is a, benefit, a benevolent system for real solutions. Participate in it, and we can create a new world. Fox in America comes off with leadership and high principles, a sense of humility, because even the hard-hearted Simon Cowell can be shown to cry. And we have an obligation as Americans to be able to come out and do something. So you get this buying, quite frankly, of the American myth. It sutures this vision of our cultural narrative where we're out to help the world to a, a large population that wants to do that, perhaps rightly. And of course, this is a quote from Simon Business, uh, which I'm sure he didn't mean, but I thought it fits very adequately. Um, he said, okay, well, we, we hope you've enjoyed yourself. And before he gives an iTunes plug, he says, we're back to business tomorrow night, which I thought was very interesting, right? Now, in 2009, there was no show. The industry insiders said that if idle officials didn't want to ask people to donate money when the economy was in such dire straits, with unemployment rates continuing to rise. 2010 show actually gave back to America as well as uh, the, the world, so a recognition, I guess, of some problems that we have here. But the interesting part was this. The fans did not like the fact that nobody was eliminated on the 2000 and 2008 show. They wanted their blood and circuses, so to speak, or bread and circuses. So in 2010, they said, and this was a quote again, we're going to bring back the idea of global charity as it re uh, intersects with shattered dreams. Not quite sure what to make of that. Uh, so what is it? American Idol <laughs> matters, not just as a pop culture phenomenon, but as an institution that works with scary efficiency at a time when so many other American enterprises seem flawed or imperiled. It stands out, this is 2009, this season in particular, American Idol is a money-making machine in the middle of a worldwide recession, an old-fashioned must-see television hit at a time when the internet and cable have eaten away at the network's hegemony. There are currently no plans for 2012, although it should be said that basically of the franchises, I'm aware of 42 that also did American Idol Gives Back. So around the world, this is a global phenomena. Now, I went online to sort of see what's going on here, and it says, well, you, you can donate, and let's see if this will work. This was checked yesterday. So there's a space here you can basically click on, and it takes you to a page where um, you're still able to donate 20, 50, 100, or 250. I thought, well, this is good. Maybe there's more information here. And I came down on the side here to take a look at, uh, oh, oh, that was no good. How do I get back to that? Uh, Working with someone else's computer doesn't help me too much. Sorry. Uh, from current slide. Okay. Uh huh. This is my big finale, and already I've blown it. <laughs> uh, so we want to come down here. Where will my money go? Of course, this is great. So click on that if we if we can. Click here. And where will my money go? Let's see if it's still as it was yesterday. The page you are looking for does not <laughs> exist. 
I just would leave you with one last thing, if I could, uh, just to go back. Uh, I thought that was just so telling and so perfect uh, that it disappears into the void, and ultimately that will, that will be where your money is. Um, and uh, my final conclusion. All right. Thank you very much. That's what I wanted to leave you with, this wonderful vision of Simon and the African children and corporate America helping you. So thank you very much. Appreciate it. is by Andre Dolce and Rodrigo Gomez, and they will be talking about addressing continuity and change in television conception and its economic model in Mexico. So. Oh, thank you, thank you. Hello, well, thank you very much. Um, I think this reflection on American Idol is a, a very good sort of background uh, for our presentation, because uh, actually um, we're, gonna talk we're gonna be talking about Mexico and how Mexican politics and Mexican economic model of development of media has been highly, st um, strongly structured by uh, Televisa, one of the major uh, media companies in the world. And, and Televisa actually has been organizing a teleton uh, over the last 15 years. And it's basically the same discourse and perhaps more per per uh, perverse in many other ways. But we will talk later, later on about this. Uh, Perhaps two, thing, two important things. One is that Rodrigo and myself, are the, is the first time we're collaborating uh, from, from different uh, perspectives. He's uh, special, more specialized in uh, political economy. I'm coming for a, for, from a, a cultural studies background. So uh, this is uh, the first time we're actually working together in this, m making this presentation. So we want to make a reflection about uh, so basically- We are going to fight. We're going to fight, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Uh, 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 sort of general reflection on, on uh, an intervention on these discourses about convergence and convergence, convergence culture and, and how it's actually taking place in Mexico. It is almost, um, now it's almost common sense that media convergence um, is generating an, an unprecedented mutation in the communica communication industry uh, and the ways in which audiences are consuming and interacting with their products. Global capitalism is clearly structuring different and contradictory implications for our media-saturated lives. Yet, we are now starting to see some evidence in Mexico that somehow challenges uh, to rethink the significance of media convergence. Thus, we ask ourselves, how is media convergence taking place in Mexico? What happens to convergence, convergence, convergence culture, if there, is, if there is such a thing, in a context strongly shaped by monopolistic media structures vast socioeconomic inequalities and a persistent anti-democratic political tendency. What is happening to Mexican televisual space as a result of the collusion of technological change with the local historical, economic, and cultural idiosyncrasies? Um, the emergence of modern Mexican state after the re revolution um, sponsored uh, among many other things, the creation of one of the biggest and most successful media corporations worldwide, Televisa. Both the Partido Revolucionario Institucional, uh, the party of the uh, uh, institutionalized revolution, the PRI, and Telesistema Mexicano, which was the original name of Televisa, worked together in a paradigmatic political venture to construct a powerful symbolic uh, national framework sustained by pseudo-democratic uh, hegemonic practices. This in turn has fostered a sociocultural configuration of a national televisual and cultural industry heavily oriented by oligopolistic interests. Televisa has become a key player in the constitution of a national public sphere by setting out with the consent and complicity of the state, both a suitable regulatory framework and the general cultural and commercial conditions to maintain its dominance. 
Such um, powerful historical moves have left the public broadcasting system in an underdeveloped and economically precarious condition across the country. Public broadcasting systems uh, in Mexico are marginal in terms of audiences, production, and funding. The television stations that are under the control of and funding of the federal government are only two uh, on a national level, Canal 11 and Canal 22. But none of these have a national reach. Uh, in 2010, uh, Canal 11 finally expanded its, co its coverage to 47% of households in the country. Canal 22 remains restricted in terms of open air co coverage to Mexico City, the suburban area of the Estado de Mexico, and the south and center of Hidalgo State, as well as the southern Quer Querétaro State. The total number of t TV licenses for non-private um, uh, instances is of 285. Um, the majority of these licenses are under the discretionary control of the 32 local state governments and public universities. Uh, as Guillermo Orozco, a uh, well-known uh, researcher in Mexico, puts it, Mexican uh, public and private initiative, um, sorry, um, I think I got this wrong. Um, any, any public or private initiative that needs to broaden or wants to broaden the audiovisual landscape in Mexico has to assume that historically audiences have lived substantial parts of their televisual experiences and expe expectations guided by the conditions dictated by the Televisa system. Thus, any effort to change the dominant par paradigm needs to confront such a powerful habitus, not only throughout a pluralist redistribution of local and national TV licenses, but also in terms of an effective cult cultural diver diver diversification. The point of the earlier um, image of the, uh, uh, the, of the journal, La Jornada, which is, which is uh, pointing out that uh, um, the, the, most, the, the richest Mexican people is actually uh, consuming 57% uh, of the country's good is just a hint to try to understand how television audiences are also structurally in the, at this socioeconomic level. And this is important because of the reasons we'll uh, explore later on. Yes, uh, as you can see, Mexico has a lot of contradictions. And in, in the television system, we can see it as more uh, contradictory way to, to see the the power of the economic actors. For example, if you see uh, the distribution in terms of advertisement, the Mexican total advertisement investment, investment sorry, is, is huge. But the thing is that the television gets almost the 58% of all the total advertisement investment. That uh, gives us uh, a clue or the, the major uh, money that generates the television in Mexico. And those uh, structures continues with the digitalization of the media. In fact, we have to say, as we know, the digital technologies open the possibility to end the scarcity of the spectrum and think of an era of abundance in broadcasting. This fact is important because in the case of Mexico, digitalization became an opportunity to break down the duopoly in television controlled by Televisa and TV Azteca. Nevertheless, since Vicente Fox's administration was uh, the early 2000s, established the terrestrial digital television policy in 2004, there, was, there has not been any interest shown by Mexican authorities to open up the TV spectrum to new players at national level. In fact, the Mexican state has not given a private TV license since 1993. We are trying to say here to establish that the relations of power in digital world continues even though the technology gives some opportunity to open the digital spectrum and to have a diversity and pluralistic system. The problem is the power that has in economic way, but in a political way. Televisa pressures uh, in important ways, in different important ways, to the political system and to the political parties, and doesn't allow to open, finally, this uh, possibility that gives the digitalization. So, it's important to, to make this point clear, because digitalization in 
itself has not affected the monopolies and dominant positions of media companies. On the contrary, in the case of me Mexico, the award of, of RAF of digital terrestrial license to the dominant TV operators, Televisa and TV Azteca, without sharing fees, has closed doors to opportunities that digitalization should bring by operating the radio frequency spectrum. This is situation is mainly the result of the lack of political will on the parts of both government and, cross and Congress to adopt a public policy aimed at democratizing Mexico's communication system, exploiting the advantage brought by digitaliza digitalization in terms of more eff uh, efficient spectrum use. In addition, cross-ownership concentration continues to grow with Grupo Televisa in particular, further bolstering its, pos its position. Televisa business model is based on incorporating all lines of media production and controlling a large number of distribution platforms. Such a model has negative reper repercussions on independent producers because Televisa control the distribution chain and release mostly in on its own production. These figures, as you can see, is the revenues that Televisa has in terms of advertisement. It controls almost the 90% uh, of the uh, revenues. In the other hand, we have to say that Televisa and TV Azteca hold together the 94% of the television frequencies, 95% of the audiences, and 96% of the TV adver advertisement investment. Um, according to the uh, IVOPI AGB uh, company, in the last 12 years, the, the number of households with at least one tele t television set has increased less than 1%, reporting that TV reaches now 99% of the national population in Mexico. The average TV viewing time per household is about uh, 4.5 hours a day, and the difference in the amount of time invested in such activities is very contrasting, as heavy viewers watch as three times more than TV more TV, sorry, than light viewers. Um, uh, according to the last survey carried by, uh, out by Obitel, the um, uh, Ibero-American Observatory of uh, Television Fiction and, and, and other genres, uh, uh, the most popular content in Mexico's terrestrial free-to-air television are telenovelas first, films, sports, and magazine shows. In 2010, the two telenovelas of the year, Soy Tu Dueña and Triunfo de Amor, got uh, 25.7 rating and 20.3 rating uh, points, respectively. So um, at a national level, uh, uh, telenovelas is still really, really popular, and, 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 and Televisa and Televisión Azteca as well, with, with their respective network, can reach uh, the whole national population. Um, only 30% of households in Mexico, only 30% of households in Mexico have access to pay television via cable, uh, cable or satellite. And there is an unknown number of homes nation, uh, nationally at the national level that receive th that signal uh, surreptitiously. That, that would say that, that would be some sort of pirate, pirate TV. Um, the audiovisual circuit that constitutes uh, television as a broader social practice certainly is not confined to the set the apparatus, or to a specific content offered throughout any type of transmission or usage of the electromagnetic spectrum. Informal networks of face-to-face -face audiovisual distribution are central for vast groups of people that otherwise have no economic means to access paid television, either via cable or DVD. Mercados, markets, and tianguis, which are the uh, itinerant markets, uh, mobilize televisual content uh, that mobilized television content become u ubiquitous across different and interconnected public spaces. Hubs, uh, you know, like digital hubs, because they, they distribute DVDs and other stuff, as Tepito, uh, in most, most of Mexicans' urban settings. There is no clear picture yet of the real size of the informal audiovisual market, but a recent study carried out by American Chamber of Commerce in Mexico established that eight out of 10 people buys pirated goods a, c a category that includes film, series, music, video games, comic books, clothes, and many other, many other products. Now, very quickly, let's consider uh, some numbers on the, on the internet usage in Mexico. 
The last four years have been substantial for the growth of that domain. In 2007, around uh, 8.3 million people had access to internet in their household. And that number increased in 2010 at 16.9 millions of internet user, uh, users at, at home. According to the same source, the total of internet users in the same period of time were 22.1 million and 34.8 uh, million respectively, which means that almost a third of the Mexican population uses this technology as a mediation for their work and cultural consumption. Only one of every five households in the country has a computer. A survey asking about the media consumption in, uh, in internet reveals that just 8% of the internet users uh, actually um, use the internet to watch television programs, etc. So basically what we're trying to say here is that uh, there's like a huge uh, network of formal practices uh, around consumption and uh, television and, and, and a huge network of, of informal networks that are, are, actually, are actually also distributing television. Uh, so the, 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 uh, the, uh, the, 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 uh, the image about the La Jornada with the, that said uh, about the, the way in which the most, most people, rich peop the most um, rich people in Mexico are actually consuming most <laughs> of, the, uh, of the goods existing in Mexico is very eloquent in that sense. That means that there's a huge population of people that don't, don't have enough resources to participate in the formal market and they are actually structuring their, their, their cultural consumption in informal terms. Uh, and television plays a key uh, s uh, aspect of this. And certainly, in a way, what, I'm s what we're saying is, uh, at the same time, if we consider that only a third of Mexicans have I internet access, uh, uh, as Guillermo Orozco puts it, uh, Mexican uh, you know, sociocultural configuration has been sort of oriented very strongly by, uh, by uh, Televisa in many ways. Uh, so that's, that's kind of like a, 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 an interesting point about this whole thing on convergence, because it means that all these possibilities, as Rodrigo was saying, um, that, brings up, that bring up uh, the new technologies are being limited and also structured uh, by this historical process. Yes, and, and at the same time, we have to think these problems not just in Mexican case, it's Obviously. in a globalized case. Now we have to have that figure in, in our minds when we talk about television. Yes, television in U.S. could be better sound and better image, image. but in Mexico there are a lot of problems that involve uh, around over the world in cultural terms, in economic terms, and of course in social cultural terms. So in a sense, it's a way of talking about how convergence is it's, it's, it's also structure, structured by hegemonic historical practices. And that's, I think, really, really interesting because there are uh, you know, substantial connections with um, American media, mostly, and American content, which is mediated. OK, that's, that's alarm. Um, <laughs> It's it's mediated. It's 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 um, it's it's mediated by Televisa. I mean, the most important uh, cable services are owned by Televisa. Uh, some of the uh, most uh, popular shows are actually shown by Televisa and structured and framed by Televisa. So uh, it's a huge problem that we have to face in terms of the design of, of public policy, but also in the at the level of civil society, which which has been. Uh, in many ways very effective trying to broaden up uh, the, the, the national public sphere, but in a sense we're also retracting. <laughs> so the, the, uh, the challenge is, is, is huge. Thank you. Uh, that's it. Okay, uh, our final speaker is uh, Harsha Gangad Harpatla from the University of Oregon, and he's uh, going to talk about television, globalization, and the crisis of U.S. cultural imperialism.
Thank you, Teddy. Uh, thank you for being here today. Sorry, um, us Mac users have to be difficult. <laughs> So a uh, couple of things before I start, actually, um, I should put it out there because I'm kind of nervous to talking about this issue is the fact that I'm not a political economist. I don't do research in this area. In fact, I might be part of the problem because I kind of work in advertising and related areas. So um, anyway, now that's out, of, out there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the other thing I was going to say is that because of that, the uh, the literature and you know the, the the way in which I've dealt with the issue may be very superficial and and, and in some instances very broad strokes that might in fact be the problem in, in this uh, area. Uh, but uh, my hope for this um, talk is to kind of start a discussion, and I'm also interested in in, in this area and what other people think about uh, the issue of um, cultural imperialism and globalization and what's happening. Um, so I was sort of hoping that I would. You know, talk about this, and then we can discuss and see what you guys think about it. Um, so, um, excuse me if some of this is basic, but to me it was very interesting um, going through the process of of researching and looking at this issue itself. Um, for instance, you know, I came up with the title even before the rookie mistake, right? Came up with the title before even delving deeply into the into the. How about this? Okay, uh, yeah, so so after looking at some of the um, articles and, and reading about this, you know, there may not even be a crisis to begin with, and I think that's one of the conclusions that I've come to is that the, um, it, it might appear or some, uh, I don't know, it looks like there is a crisis, but in the end, there really may not be a crisis in the, in the cultural uh, imperialism that I'm going to talk about. But anyway, uh, we'll get to that conclusion through the um, slides that I have here. So let me define briefly um, what cultural imperialism is. It's the process of you know, social influence by which one nation imposes or sort of tries to exert pressure uh, overtly or in, you know, in, uh, implicitly to change and influence a set of beliefs and value system and behavior of another nation. So this is the general operating definition that cultural imperial imperialism works under. And this uh, is argued that it is achieved through, a uh, through media content. And again, the second limitation of what I'm talking about today is I'm, because of the scope of the conference, I'm looking at just television, but that's just tiny, tiny piece of the, the big piece of the, uh, the control media content, uh, you know, Hollywood, and um, you know, now internet and other uh, websites and other things that are um, prevalent in the rest of the world. So there are a number of other ways, uh, including video games and emerging media, that you could do this. But uh, again, the scope is just limited to television, and that's one of the drawbacks of this, um, is looking at just the medium of television. So, uh, so what I started doing and looking at is, well, let's talk, let's look at the exploitation of culture and how that's sort of sorted. Uh, in literature points um, to uh, right after Cold War, there's this you know uh, amazing transfer or flow of culture, if you want to call it, uh, with U.S. media and television dominating both Second and Third World, and and uh, and, slow and this is widely acknowledged. Uh, but the consequences of this are that you know, the McDonaldization of the planet, and people were talking about how. Uh, the socio cultural political economic roots of native cultures are being changed and altered and in some cases destroyed um, so this is this was this was in the uh, height of you know uh, the neoliberal policies in india and other places as well where there's um, companies were allowed to come into and set up shop and you know media were being uh, sort of slowly moving away from the state control to private uh, control and all of these um, sort of facilitated the move of the flow of culture from uh, the Western world to many of the uh, developing nations. Um, so, so my main premise here is that um, may, is it possible that now uh, there are cracks beginning to appear, uh, or there's some sort of challenge to the American hegemony, if you want to call it that, um, because of the way I'm going to lay out a couple of our argument saying that it may be possible uh, because of the crisis of capitalism that U.S. is undergoing, um, and then you know the globalization and all of those other consequences that are uh, the consequences of that as well. So, 
so uh, the idea being that there may be cracks in here, but that's, the, that's what I want to ultimately talk and discuss uh, with you guys to see if that's even uh, a possibility or if that's something that we just tell ourselves to uh, you know, feel good and nothing will ever change, you know, sort of thing. Right, so flow of culture, right? So this, the looking at, the first thing I realized is political economy is really hard. I'm, I mean, looking at the idea of just content is not gonna just do it, right? So that's where I started looking at, well, cultural flow has been one way to an extent, you know, with Baywatch, and I grew up with, you know, Friends and Ally McBeal and Buffy, uh, and Buffy the Vampire Slayer and, and Simpsons and things like that. But after I moved here, I've noticed that there's a lot of shows that are coming to the US, for instance, we talked about American Idol. And again, this is a complicated issue. I'm just trying to look at it from the content perspective of where it originated. But of course, there's this global complex coordination of capital. So you can't really say that, you know, because the content comes from a place, uh, that's where the means of production, you know, is the money is ultimately going to, because it's all a complex process, right? But to me, it's fascinating that there's more and more shows that are being shown everywhere else and then coming to the US. For instance, Ugly Betty is a big example. It's, it's traveled to, it started in Colombia, traveled through a lot of countries, even India, and then it's come to the US as Ugly Betty, right? So that to me is what's fascinating. And then you have other shows like The Office. If you notice that most of them are from uh, European, you know, British um, area, but there are also other areas too that content is being produced and coming to the US from. So um, as I said, you know, these shows are being remade and not really the way that they're, you, they're transferred from the US, right? Fr Friends plays in India, it's just, it's the exact same Friends. There's no remake of it. But I've noticed that in the US, it's sort of a remake with the American version and Amer for the American audience. So maybe it's not really all that much of a flow if you wanna talk about it. But the other thing I've noticed is that the popularity of American TV is sort of you know, going down um, in the rest of the world. For instance, there was an article that talked about how Channel 4 asked the number of American shows, and then if you look at the top 70 shows, 70% uh, uh, so of the top 10 shows uh, in 60 countries, most of them are you know, locally produced and not exported from the US, and it's the Nielsen Media Survey. I don't know how much credibility you want to pay to that, but uh, attention you want to pay to that, but. Um, and it's also just that even though the number of channels are increasing, there's a possibility that maybe uh, it, you know, there's local content uh, becoming famous as well, uh, or popular as well. So what are some of the reasons why this could be happening, right? So first one, globalization, obviously the world is shrinking. Um, you know, the traditional constructs, uh, constructs of time and space are being redefined. Uh, things are happening, uh, you know, for instance, in, in, the, in India you have all these uh, websites now that can, hire people to uh, do stuff on Elance and guru.com or whatever, right? So there's a lot of animation work that's outsourced uh, to other countries. So there's, there's a lot of things that are happening that could ultimately break down the barriers of entry and maybe level the playing field if, if we wanted to look at it for capitalists in other countries to take advantage of that. Uh, for uh, examples that I can think of is that the uh, uh, Indian cricket uh, premier, it's sort of like the NFL, the Indian Premier League in India, uh, started showing or broadcasting their um, shows on YouTube, uh, their, their game, the matches on each, uh, YouTube for everybody else on the, uh, the rest of the world. So that would not have been possible if there were, if the, if the, tradi if the in the traditional sense, the gatekeepers or the, the conglomerates that could control it. Right now, given uh, that the prevalence of new media, uh, uh, Indian sports or Indian shows are now have, a, have an access or a venue to transmit to other countries and somehow uh, you know, capitalize on this if you want to look at it that way. But I think that my biggest um, argument or sort of support would be the, the issue that there is a crisis in US capitalism as every system would be. I mean, capitalism is not a, so it's, it's a spiraling system. It ultimately has to come down in some sense, right? So if capital, our capitalism needs to constantly reinvent itself, find cheaper, faster, more efficient ways to, uh, to accumulate capital, uh, then that's an inherent problem in itself because that's a system that's going to be spiraling. And you always have to find, you know, if you look at it, if, if, if a company makes 10% profit, right, it's not good enough 
next year it has to be 12%. So there's always this notion of you have to push yourself beyond. So that has led to, to companies finding cheaper and, and other, other sorts of labor in third world countries. And that has led to infrastructure and you know not just talking about the highways and other things that are being built there, but technologically there are things that are being constructed and built in, in the developing countries that these that the work is being outsourced to um, that are developing and, and working with these technologies. So now you know you, these these companies that have been developing these technologies could make their own content with that technology, right? So there's this possibility that you can use some of the technology that you're developing to make con to transfer content, and uh, and it's sort of resulting in a market strong enough to make maybe content and export it to other countries. And there are anecdotal examples of this uh, with Netflix. Now there's a much larger content of Bollywood movies uh, on Netflix, and there's transfer, and then there's ways in which you can look at um, making you know, the idea of Bollywood itself is ap appealing to the Western audience by cutting down on their length and cutting down on the songs. And there's a lot of Indian capitalists that are working on, uh, you know, Westernizing Bollywood. For instance, Ronnie Screwwala is a, is a name that comes up. He, uh, he's essentially redesigned the format of Bollywood to the Western audience. And so much so that he's also now started producing some of the Hollywood movies. And I think there's one that came out with M. Night Shyamalan as the director. So there's a lot of that happening as well. But I don't know how much of this is um, you know, really viable, uh, because I'm going to talk about the implications and, and conclusion a little bit. But this is, this is yeah, you know, there's, this is creating a, a niche or, or a, 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 you know, advantage that un local entrepreneurs and capitalists can take uh, advantage of in, in creating these. Or uh, there's an emergence of local entrepreneurs. Um, OK. So in conclusion, I would say that um, American media uh, are probably going to draw. I mean, this is not something that you know. Just because there are a little bit of cracks in the, in in the system, or, or appearance of cracks cracks in the system, it's not going to go away. I mean, it's, it's it's going to dominate the world market. But there are challenges in the form of other capitalists in other countries uh, coming up. Um, in, and that could be something that we can talk about and see if you agree or disagree uh, with that issue. Um, but to me, the issue of cultural imperialism and the crisis of ca ca and capitalism are inextricably tied. So as and when the American system sort of faces with the issue of what next cap you know, uh, in capitalism, the influence that it has has to go down. And whoever comes up next uh, as the emerging power, I mean, sort of has to uh, you know, take over in, in, in some sense if you want to look at it that way. But uh, I want to conclude with these uh, limitations. Obviously, there's really no empirical ev evidence here. I'm not looking at the exact numbers or the, the financial values. And that's partly because it's really complex to understand where the money are or, the, or to follow the money in, in today's world because there's a lot of co production that happens. And, it, and, and it's not just one nation. And even that leads to me, that leads to the next point, that even the idea of nationality and nation states may be completely uh, irrelevant in today's world because given the complex um, way in which capital is organizing in today's world, uh, just to look at one nation or one nation state as you know, putting some sort of, exerting some sort of, or imposing some sort of imperialism uh, may be a moot point at this uh, juncture. All right, so that's what I have. Uh, All right, thank you all. Um, I'll open it now for questions and discussions. Um, the person who was talking about American Idol, um, were you saying they didn't want American Idol gives back on the air? Or they didn't want the Jerry Lewis telethon? And why would the Fox stations encourage people to not carry that? No, I think I can borrow your microphone. <laughs> <laughs> um, what I was saying was that uh, in 1987, Fox, as a part of the uh, diversification of and fragmentation of media, um, and no longer beholden to some of the rules in terms of public interests and necessary uh, sort of broadcast laws and policies, um, discouraged its, its uh, affiliates from carrying the MDA 
telethon. And so if we take a look at from, say, mid-'80s until, you know, the last five or six years, we see uh, the increasing fragmentation breaks down this idea of the telethon itself as a global or a say, communal event, a national communal event. So ultimately, the developments that occur sort of politically and economically push the MDA telethon uh, as a moment uh, that we all gather around in Labor Day to just be in another option for the people to actually use should they decide to, and many people chose not to in terms of affiliates. Now, American Idol, what I'm suggesting is that the very idea of the telethon has shifted in a lot of material ways as well as you know, sort of uh, meaningful ways, uh, symbolic ways, so to speak. And what we're seeing is some of the same tropes, the same frameworks um, that are utilized to effect compassion, empathy, and ultimately donations utilized with American Idol. But what they're actually doing is rather than, as Jerry Lewis trying to, as you know, some of the people I quoted um, have written, where they're trying to get you to empathize and understand the, the less fortunate and therefore basically give money to help the multiple uh, MDA, uh, you end up rather with a situation where the audience is invited to not necessarily relate to the Africans that were helping, but to relate to the celebrities, i.e. Simon Cowell and all of the judges, as a means of saying, these are the people that are actually having with heart, and, and, and what it does ultimately is it covers over the fact that they're making millions and millions of dollars, donating very little, and in fact using that compassion, that empathy, and those sort of the spec specular gaze to draw us into, um, you know, basically feeling that this is the way to solve the world through the structures of capital as they're outlaid in American Idol. So that's what I was saying. Uh, this is more of a comment than a question, just comment on a um, slide Harsha had put up. I just want to, I guess, alert people that the IPL, which you may not know of, is the, uh, the Cricket League in India, is a, is a kind of interesting phenomenon because it's a case of a hyper-capitalized entity, hyper-capitalized in the sense enormous amounts of money being paid to cricketers, which has had the uh, kind of anti-imperialist effect of moving the center of gravity of cricket from, say, Lords or Melbourne to to Chennai or Bangalore. And uh, so, so it, it, it needs a lot more study, I think. So I'm glad Definitely. you brought it. Yeah. And you're right. And it's not just Indian cricketers, right? It's, it's, a, it's a global, and everybody competes to get in that in sort of sense. Yeah, you're right. Interesting. Thank you. Uh, and of course, the market model of the IPL was devised by people from the Cass Business School in London. Wow. And the model is, is derived in turn from the US model of uh, state subvention, what's called socialism by state, socialism by stealth, state subvention of basketball and football and baseball professional activities, i.e. the development costs of creating successful cricketers, basketballers, footballers, baseballers, is not the responsibility of the private enterprises. Whereas in the, within the IPL model, where the draft is supposedly derived from the US model by these British economists. In fact, it doesn't operate that way. They are still relying on the development costs being met by others, but they're not bothering to invest in any sense downstream. They're simply creating a draft of already successful, proven, mature, in many cases, elderly cricketers. So it's not clear how long the model that the British devised for the IPL will work. The second thing about uh, the paper, which I thought was, was great, is that uh, in terms of the International Division of Cultural Labor and the way that Hollywood in particular, as both a television site and a film site, draws on it, that's been happening for 80 years. Mm -hmm. And in terms of the United States remaking television programs, especially from Britain, that's been happening for 50 years. It hasn't really gathered pace. In terms of viewing figures and, and program content, if you go outside China, 85% of children's TV around the world comes from one country, the United States. If you look more closely in most countries at the ratings figures, they've always been quite low in, in probably the majority of countries for US television drama. The point about the US penetration, to coin a phrase, is twofold. One, it's not amongst the top rating programs. That's never the desire, it's never the plan. It's that as markets liberalize, i.e. they become more outlets, you need lots of TV. Most countries don't have a big archive. This country does, and it provides it. The second thing is that if you look in particular at a place like Brazil, one of your examples amongst the BRICS, 
as you, as and the same thing happens in somewhere like Malaysia or Indonesia in many cases, no one's much interested in US TV except for US cinema, which often on television is much more successful than it's been in, for example, first run theatrical markets where it may have had very little presence at all. And frequently, it's only going to be Hollywood popular films that become prime time fare in many other countries when they're sold on. So I think it's important to look at the history of the cultural labor and that exchange because this isn't new. Right. Uh, and it's been studied for decades by people. Right. And also to think about this question of it doesn't matter that there aren't many US television programs that rate highly. That's not the point. It never has been. It's the films that rate highly and the TV dramas that simply take up the space. Now the next thing to talk about after that, and I'm going to shut up, don't worry, <laughs> <laughs> is the relevance of this to the basic media or cultural imperialism thesis, which is about there being more than just a structural homology or an industrial power, but actually a textual content that helps to ramify not just US power, but the power of the former colonial powers and their influence over the former you know, enslavement of other people. Thank you. Yeah, this is to Andrew Lewis. Can you mm, tell us the ownership pattern of uh, the television in Mexico? Is it state-owned media or private, and who are the owners? Who owns Televisa? Ah, uh, no, it's privately owned, and, and it was it was it was uh, founded um, in the 1950s. Um, Together with this, with the government of that time, at that time, so it's it's a, it's a in, in many ways it's a, it's a very sort of paradigmatic way in how how uh, the state uh, has fostered uh, uh, a very strong private sector, but very oligo uh, oligopolistic um, uh, private sector in, in 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 media, mostly in media and communications uh, technology. So it's it's very interesting in in, th in that sense. Uh, it has been claimed in some instances that uh, Mexico and Brazil are now playing uh, a new role as, as uh, content producers for the whole Latin America and the whole um, Spanish-speaking world. And that's relevant in many ways because, yes, in a sense, it's is, is kind of like, sh you know, uh, challenge, challenge, challenging us to think in a new ways about cultural imperialism. Uh, because the problem now is that we will see in the next years, in the case of Mexico particularly, the dominant role of Televisa and Telmex uh, across the whole uh, continent. And that's very important, including the United States, uh, because uh, Carlos Slim, the owner, I don't know if you know this, but Carlos Slim is uh, the, the, the biggest, the, the richest uh, individual in the world. Uh, he's Mexican, and he, he actually uh, made all this fortune in the 1990s be because of the... Uh, uh, the privatization of the uh, uh, telecom te telecommunication sector in Mexico. So uh, he's now investing in the United States, in the whole Latin America, and in he's actually investing a lot of money in content, content production as well. So um, uh, we will see in a way, uh, as we are seeing now, how Mexico is actually selling a lot of formats uh, to Spain and the whole Latin America. Obviously it happens also in Colombia and Venezuela in a lesser degree, but these are very dominant co uh, companies. So in a way, uh, uh, we see a, a new, very sort of dominant trend of Mexicanization uh, in Latin America and Brazil, Brazil you know, you, you that. <laughs> yeah, on, on, on the irrelevance of the nation state, I mean, you've just had Rodrigo and Andre give you a very clear example of why you can't say that that you, for a start there are more nation states now than there were 20 years ago, that most regulatory systems where they exist are national. Mm -hmm. uh, most, most countries that have free to air broadcasting have a regulatory system, some don't need it. I mean, there's, there's almost nothing in Mexico, is it, which it doesn't need it. <laughs> the power is so fully entrenched in, in a couple of, of individuals. But y you are, you're looking at a rhetoric of globalization that has its own self-interest that has, I think, dominated a lot of talk of about, about television, particularly from the US. But once you actually look at other markets, you see it works very differently. And even in India, you've got a situation where um, India has worked out how to use television as, as a form of soft power 
in the way that America has done and how China is doing as well. And so the expansion of television in India is really connected to um, work that's being done now on the connection between the rising middle class and the notion of Indian identity that's a kind of cosmopolitan outward looking identity that's looking to exert influence across the region. And so you know, that's, that's a national enterprise even though it expresses itself through a form of cosmopolitanism. And so that, you know, I, I simply don't think there's any evidence um, to say, e even, in the, in, even in the regulation of the internet, to say that the nation state is irrelevant. Tell that to China, tell that to Singapore, tell that to Saudi Arabia that they can't regulate the internet. They no, can. Yeah, definitely. But, but you can't do it within a Western democracy. <laughs> and you know, there, are not, there are lots of places that aren't, that aren't those. And, and so the argument that the nation state is irrelevant, I mean, it's an interesting question to follow. But I think if you look at, at enough places and you come back and say, well, yeah. it might look like that from some locations, but in most of the cases, uh, it's not true. Right. No, you're right. I should have actually qualified that saying in the, in, in the cons, in the context of looking at global flow of you know capital is what I was saying the nation state and not in every sense because the example that he was giving right so the IPL has British influence and sort of it's it's still happening in India but the interest behind or the means of production are still coming from somewhere else and they're connected and that's what I mean to say sorry everybody Maybe uh, another remark that we didn't say it before. It's about that at the end uh, we are trying to to see in this paper how the culture is organized in, in a digital world. Uh, and that's uh, the, the big issue in our paper because it's not uh, opening the possibilities that the Mexican diverse culture has. So at the same time, it's guided for the economic powers and the public power is uh, more weak in front of this. And what are the implications? Of course, there are contra-hegemonic expressions in our country. Uh, yes, and it is very important, but uh, it's in the margin, in the margins. And uh, let me just share these uh, numbers. Uh, which I think are very eloquent. Um, according to uh, Conaculta, which is a state uh, instance that s sort of um, deals with the, the cultural policy, and national cultural policy, um, only 27% of Mexicans have read a book last year. 86% uh, ha ha of Mexicans have never been to an art exposition. 43% of Mexicans don't know a uh, library. So uh, what I'm saying is uh, I this is partly due because of many omissions in the state policy, obviously, uh, inequalities, et cetera, et cetera, but it's also because the way in which um, Televisa and these corporate conglomerates of, of culture are actually working. And the point about cultural imperialism coming from the third world or the second world or whatever you want to call it is that um, we're going we're gonna to see these models being uh, exported somewhere else. So we <laughs> Uh, what I'm saying is Mexican, Mexican culture or Mexican, uh, 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 the configuration of Mexican cultures going through the lenses and the processes of Televisa and many other companies are going out in a very restrictive way, uh, culturally speaking. It's not, it's, not, it's not reflecting the diversity, as Rodrigo said, of, of the cultural diversity of Mexico. It's not reflecting the ideological diversity, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. In that sense, I find that very dangerous. And, and obviously, it happens the same with the United States in, in terms of the influx that comes from the United States. However, in the United States, the democracy or the democracy model works in a f f uh, fairly more sort of pluralistic way that it works in Mexico. So we also receive a lot of things, a very rich and very nice things from the United States. And, and probably in those fluxes coming from Televisa, many people are not going to be receiving the very nice things that are being produced in Mexico. So, you know? So you've almost answered my question, actually. It was for Rodrigo and Andre. And I wanted to know about the relationship between Mexican cultural policy and television. And the reason I ask that is that Mexico has the most 
powerful cultural policy. And they, the cultural policy was most investment in it was anywhere I've ever seen. And certainly right across Latin America, there's nowhere else that has that level of investment. So yeah. you, know, you can be a Trotskyist poet mm -hmm. and win national prizes funded by the government endlessly. So counter discourse mm -hmm. exists quite powerfully, but does it have any relation? No, that, that's the thing. Uh, the uh, Mexican government make an alliance with Televisa and say, okay, you, are, you have the business and you are going to do everything with television what you want. And uh, there are not direct policies in terms of culture directed with TV on cultural industries. The cultural industries are domained by Televisa in all the sectors. And at the same time, Mexican government spent a lot of money in museums, in, in the high exhibition, the high uh, culture, <laughs> if you allow me to say that in, in those times, but to, to, to figure out what we are talking about. Uh, and yes, that's uh, the big issue, I think. What we're trying to do actually is, is, is try to construct an intervention uh, within different spheres in Mexico. One of them is the Mexican state, obviously, and, and, and legislation as well. And we're trying to bring together uh, uh, cultural policy together with uh, communication and media policy that are, and telecom policy, which is now operating with different logics. And that this is gener generating a, a schizophrenic framework that is actually uh, you know, uh, dealing with culture. So we need to sort of come together and try to, 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 to build a very refined sort of framework to, to intervene. And yes, uh, it's, it's amazing. Uh, the, the strength of, of, of Mexican uh, cultural policy uh, uh, and the contrast against uh, media regulation. Uh, in, and another thing, yeah, just for finish, the contents that Univision receive are Televisa contents. So we, uh, the, the thing is the ties with Univision are so high and one of the most revenues that Televisa gets from the world is from US. But the thing is, what kind of content is doing Televisa? <laughs> Maybe one more question. And you can wrap it up. Maybe I can claim the opportunity myself. Um, <laughs> so uh, I was very interested to hear that in, in, in Mexico, there is really a high rate of uh, consumption of pirated ma material and mm -hmm. I think I, it, it can be the same in, in many places mm -hmm. in, in the rest of the world and uh, I understand Mexico is um, a member of the World Trade Organization, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if there is a discrimination on the part of the government on local content as opposed to international content on as far as regulating uh, pirated materials uh, is concerned. I, th I think that there there's no, as far as I know, there's no, no coherent policy against piracy. There, there, there's a discourse saying that uh, the Mexican state is intervening, intervening systematically to, to ban all sort of practices of, of pirate uh, uh, market, et cetera, et cetera. But um, there's no, in, the, in, the, in terms of your question, all pirate content is, is, is systematically um, uh, they are tr systematically trying to to um, get rid of, of it, or just to ban it and to burn it and to etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. There's no distinction between international content or Mexican content, as far as I know. Um, but what is interesting to see is that uh, even 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 pirate the, the, the pirate offering or the pirate offer of of uh, of the cultural industry of the informal cultural industry is not as diverse as we would like to like it to be. It's a, it's it's an interesting opportunity for diversity, and it, it is not present there. What you see is Avatar, uh, Star Wars, etc., etc., etc. So, <laughs> in a sense, you know, all these very poor people, what they want to see and the way in which they want to belong, is by actually getting to watch um, CSI, uh, Friends, The Simpsons, etc., etc. Buying it for uh, one dollar, by the way, which is really cheap. So. Uh, Less than water. And the other thing about this thing is that we're also seeing alternative uh, distribution platform platforms of digital content. And this is a, a new rhetoric, I think, about uh, fluxes and the way they work in the urban space and how they are, you know, uh, the, the, their logic.
intrinsic logic. I, th I think that's interesting. So thank you very much. Help me uh, congratulating.